Hi everyone, this is Lucas Chaffee with Kiko Chat. Here we're doing an interview of Steve Hollier, who's gonna teach us how he did an online Mardi Gras. Steve, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, thank you. Um, where should I begin? So let's begin with what was the purpose of the event and how did you approach the design of the event? What were you thinking when you initially heard of the event's gonna happen? And mm -hmm. what were some of the initial steps to bring this event to life online? Okay, now you know, you, you realize by now I'm a storyteller and you're just giving me the chance to tell a story for about an hour. So we're gonna all be stuck here, but I'll try to, I'll try to organize that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I wear a few hats in, and uh, my job though is as a consultant, uh, founder of my company, and I uh, am, I say, I call myself a strategic agile coach. And for people who are familiar with agile ways of working, uh, that's a way to uh, many businesses are looking at and to organize the work around a few simple tenants and procedures and practices. Um, and I work with people with that, but my, and my real passion is open space leadership, both uh, training open space facilitators and uh, holding space and told space is, is one of the, one of my joys in life. Um, and for all of us agile coaches, agile businesses, scrum masters, product owners, the Agile Alliance is an organization that promotes the values of the Agile Manifesto in the world, particularly for um, particularly for software businesses and software development. And of course, I'm a member of the Agile Alliance, have been involved with them in one form or the, uh, another conferences and things for years. Uh, at the same time, the Agile software movement really traces its official beginning. It began earlier, but its official beginning to the signing of the Agile Manifesto 20 years ago, 20 years ago in February. So another group of folks, uh, pretty much uh, in a grassroots way, organized a worldwide festival about to celebrate 20 years of the Agile Manifesto. The Agile Alliance got involved with a sponsor as a sponsor and in their planning the question is what can you do what can you do to be part of this festival as the agile alliance and somehow the date of the of the agile alliance event ended up being february 16th which is fat tuesday or mardi gras and somehow the managing director of the agile alliance she says she doesn't know how it happened but she agreed to make it an agile mardi gras so the next step was i got an email you grew up near New Orleans, right? Um, can you tell me about Mardi Gras? And I said, sure. And one of the things I said right off the bat is the Mardi Gras that a lot of people know is a walking code of conduct violation. Is that is that the invitation we want to make out into the, the world as the Agile Alliance? And of course I knew that wasn't the invitation, but what I also uh, was able to say that Mardi Gras celebration in New Orleans is varied. And in the French Quarter, it's debauchery, nudity, drunkenness, and it should be. That's what that's what it's there for. But just a few blocks away, uh, along St. Charles and um, the other avenues, there's a family-oriented celebration where the the boulevard is closed down the middle. Families are picnicking on the grass if it's nice. That's the neutral ground, and the parades roll by on the street. The children catch beads, and so. We decided that all of our communication would focus on images and words about that because we wanted to promote this idea to people who maybe didn't have the idea that there's a lot of ways to celebrate Mardi Gras. Now, the other reason Ellen from the Agile Alliance contacted me is because I live in Switzerland and Ellen has seen some connections to the, the Fasnacht happening in Switzerland and in Germany. And we thought we could start touching some of those traditions. And then we talk about, um, we talk about diversity. Uh, and so one of the key values that we wanted here is we wanted to be as inclusive as possible. Mardi Gras is also based on Catholic and Christian traditions. And so we looked at the ways we could hold a Mardi Gras that 
broadened the appeal and looked at the meaning without necessarily promoting a Western Catholic viewpoint as much as while acknowledging that it is a Western Catholic viewpoint. Okay. Um, that's all well and good. Um, finally, I was speaking with a friend who lives on the Swiss German French border who said, why are you doing a Mardi Gras? That's so old and out of date. That's, that's an old, that's an old school thing. That's for old people, which is some, some perceptions of a Mardi Gras. And, uh, I said, well, you know, for a lot of people, the agile manifesto is for old people, for young people coming out of the school, it's for old people, young old people. So I said, as we were searching for a theme, that theme just fell into our lap. Let's make the old new. Instead of looking back in nostalgia on 20 years that happened before, let's make it new and look at 20 years of the future. So there we had our theme, we had our plan. Finally, the mandate was, we are all sick of this COVID pandemic in different ways, but we all are sick of it. All of us have had strange conversations with colleagues where we've suddenly found ourselves shouting or somehow doing something else that's out of character because this is where we're all sitting. And so the main goal of this event was to just have fun like we used to. We couldn't go out to a parade. Now all my colleagues at, uh, at home in New Orleans were building Mardi Gras floats into their yard in their yard and creating a Yardi Gras. We weren't able to do that either, but let's see how we can build a Mardi Gras. So that that's the long answer to your short question, Lucas. I love it. I, I love the story of how it happened and how it grew organically, how it's designed to be inclusive, just opening people's minds, making the old new. I'd heard you say that, now I know the backstory behind it, making the old new. So now the plan is you're gonna have an online Mardi Gras and you're gonna make it happen. What are some of the steps? Um, well, I, what was the goal for how many people would attend or how many people did attend? How did you spread the word? Maybe you could share some of the logistics before the event was happening. Yes, yeah, so that that contact, that first contact from Ellen was sometime shortly before Christmas. And the responses were going by email. So by the time that it, by the time she called and said, okay, you know a lot about Mardi Gras, I'm volunteering you to, to, to organize it. And I was like, sure, I was really wanted of all the things on my plate, this felt like the one that was fun. So yes. Um, and we started looking at organizing it and thinking it's quite late to organize this event. We needed publicity to go out on January 6th because at least in New Orleans, the Mardi Gras starts on 12th night or the 6th of January, which is also Three Kings Day or the day of the Epiphany. That's when the Mardi Gras starts. So I said, if we're going to really get into this Mardi Gras, we need to have the first information roll out on 12th night, which we did. So over the, basically over the Christmas break, we started writing and producing some content and using the principles of open space, we knew that the invitation really matters. So we started crafting that information, the invitation around making the old new, finding ways to talk about that, that invited people into the theme and also invited as many people from around the world. We also on the 6th of January launched a series of postcards from different places in the world that celebrate carnival, starting with New Orleans, because of course, that's where I would start it. But, uh, but we brought in postcards from Trinidad and Tobago and uh, the UK where Mardi Gras is celebrated by eating pancakes. And that doesn't quite compute for a person who's been to the debauchery of the French Quarter of the New Orleans. In New Orleans, the, the other celebration is eating pancakes, but okay. Um, we got, and we talked, but we wrote this, these postcards all involved the history and the inclusivity and uh, acknowledged where things were coming from, who, who the, enjoyed the Mardi Gras in the old times and who didn't necessarily enjoy the Mardi Gras. We were able to le really lean into the fact that during Mardi Gras, people wear costumes in many traditions to one, put everybody on an equal footing because you don't know who's behind the costume and two, to allow people to speak truth to power in a satirical way. So we also put in our invitation, you're invited to do that. I'm not sure people, people didn't really pick up on that part of the invitation. That was a, a pretty bold move that we were just gonna put it out there and see what came back. But some people did come in masks. Some people came with beads on and things like that. The other part of organizing it is that we had a couple other volunteers, Jen Dunbeck 
and Julie Bright, as well as Ellen Grove, the managing director of the Agile Alliance, was very involved and came to every organization meeting and was there at the event. So the our sponsor was always there, which was which was a a, a wonderful experience to have an involved sponsor. And in a in, in an agile way, we lined up our tasks, writing postcards, building out, sending out the invitations, getting people interested, working with publicity. Uh, and that's how we organized the event from basically the 6th of January to the 6th, February 16th. That's the time we basically had to organize it. Super. So can you tell me about the participant experience? So what did they think they were getting into? And then what did they get into? <laughs> I'm not sure they knew, they, I'm, I'm not sure they knew what they were getting into. What we wanted to do was, um, we were very clear from the start. What we wanted to do was build an experience that was on the calendar for only two and a half hours. I had to stop and I had to pause and think, is that true? I may be lying. Maybe it was two hours. Um, we had a very limited time and we knew that in this time and we didn't feel like we could get the value out of that we would get from an open space that didn't feel it didn't feel like an open space event so we didn't we chose not to organize an open space event we wanted to organize a a series of parades and just invite people to wander freely and the explanation i think francois even used these words first um people were people were expecting to come to the event and find a very organized facilitation plan and to be directed from one activity, probably a mural to another activity, to another activity. And we, so in our talking about that, we tried to introduce in the pre uh, event information, tried to suggest that it's gonna be different. When you show up, it's gonna be different. And what we wanted to say to people is we're going to, we're going to have a, um, we're gonna open the celebration we're gonna let you know what's going on and then we're gonna allow you to wonder. And even in our organizing meetings, the question is how do people, how are people gonna do that online? Will people even wanna do that? Is that scary? And this is what Francois first mentioned was, this is a Mardi Gras parade. When you go to the Mardi Gras, wherever you are, there are things happening and a few rules that you follow. If you're in New Orleans, stand back from the street, get back on the curb as the flows run by. Otherwise, the policeman will move you back or you'll fall under the hooves of a horse or you'll fall under the wheels of a truck. So stand back on the curb. Um, respect the people around you enough that you're not encroaching on their good time. Um, and then go have fun. Oh, well, in New Orleans, another simple rule is make sure you have access to a bathroom. And, and that's serious industry in New Orleans. But um, so let's try to create a space online where we can just say, you know, you're at a parade, you're at a festival. No one's telling you what to do. There's a few suggestions. Respect the people around you so that everybody has a good time. You know, get back to the curb so you don't fall under the wheels of the bus, whatever that means. And basically, let's enjoy ourselves so that was part one and secondly we also knew again inspired by principles of open space that bringing people together in any i believe in any situation say okay you're all together let's have fun is difficult because what are we going to group build our fun around so we we knew in the online space we wanted to put purposes and different locations. So if you end up in this location, there's a purpose. And once you're there, you're invited to do something according to that purpose or not, but the purpose is there to give you something to gather and move around and be, find a place to go and ignite your passion. I love it. This is the first key insight that I'm taking is setting up a space with simple rules and people are expecting to be moved and facilitated from one space to another, but so far you've given them here, here's the guidelines for how to interact. 
And they're simple. There were only three or four of them. And then, then go have fun, which I think was also one of your rules. I love it. So Eric has a question. We're going to ask his question next. But then the question I have after that I'd hope you'd share is what, so given that what you've designed in your mind, this experience the people you want them to have, what are the spaces that you created? What are the activities for them? That's the question of my mind. But let's go to Eric's question. If you'd like to unmute yourself, Eric, and, and toss your sure. question into the mix. Um, I just wanted to know, what was an example of a purpose? Well, I mentioned we had we had crafted these postcards as some of the pre-publicity to let people who didn't know about Mardi Gras even know what it was to, to bring in the world. And with each postcard, we attempted to include something uh, relate the theme back to something that was happening uh, with Agile and with the idea of celebrating the Agile Manifesto. So because this just sticks in my mind, it was one of our more, one of our more um, challenging purposes because we had some very, some purposes that weren't so challenging, but why not have some that are really challenging? And one was, so the the celebration in the UK with eating pancakes is called Shrove Tuesday, which means comes which means confession. You're shriven. You confess your sins, and so we the purpose of one of the UK parades was to what would you like to confess to be shriven of the last twenty years of agile, which I'm not sure anybody picked up that question, but it was there. Um, we also, oh. the pancakes and the name Fat Tuesday, it all comes from the idea that by the time Mardi Gras rolls around, the, the stored up meats and fats and butters in your larder are about to spoil and go rancid. And there's also a big fast for the next 40 days before Easter. So um, this is the last day to consume all the fat in your larder before it all goes rancid. So that's another way we wanted to lean into celebration is my gosh it's february 16th after a long pandemic what kind you know just what kind of celebration do you want to put on and and what does that mean from an in an agile manifesto context if that's what you choose to discuss you know that's we've seen other social events where they've got a dj they've got a magician a comedian but this one is pretty powerful if if people are prepared for it and they just think, okay, we're gonna we're gonna leave some things behind and we're gonna move forward in in terms of thinking about the growth of a community. I think it, this probably takes time for people to get their head around. Like, wow, we're building this together, and this is an important ritual. There are rituals that people do in person. This is now a community ritual online, mm -hmm. ourselves together. How do we move forward? Uh, this is, is really brilliant. And I'm interested to hear what are some of the other spaces that you built? You had mentioned parades. There are different parades. And yeah. you what, what would you like to talk about next? Well, I would like to show you that. But before, but you, you made me, you, you helped me remember something. And it, uh, I almost, I almost suggest to, to, to tell this story, but um, I almost want to hold this story for myself, but I'm going to tell it anyway. You mentioned DJs and musicians and this is startling for people and how are you going to get them engaged? We knew that uh, around a Mardi Gras celebration, we needed music. And uh, in various cultures, the music is the center of the celebration in almost all cultures. Um, you can't have a, a Fasnacht celebration in Germany without the Gukka music. And you, know, you can't have Mardi Gras in New Orleans without jazz. So we wanted to involve music and there's what there is a problem which and you and i talked about it for a little maybe almost an hour and Buki was on that call i think is how are we going to be able to play music in this event and in my experience when you try often when you try to play music through zoom it doesn't balance something goes it you spend 20 minutes trying to figure it out is kind of what i experienced and I was like how do we avoid that and we decided based on some based on those technical constraints i put together a few things i'd heard from some other open space events into this thing people have silent discos you go to the silent disco uh, when we used to meet in person 
with your headphones and you dance around in the disco to your own music. So we asked everybody, we put a Mardi Gras playlist in Kiko chat. We asked everybody to mute their sound and we made sure that we could mute people that failed to mute their sound. We asked people to pick a song and then dance to it. Like no, like everybody's watching, because we were. Turn on your cameras and dance to it. And we didn't know what was exactly what was gonna happen. We had a whole bunch of people dancing together. We didn't worry about the music that was playing through the speakers. And it appeared that everybody was dancing to the same song, although we know that everyone was listening to their own music. But it looked like we were having a community event, dancing together. And that's what was important, this feeling we were doing something together as a community that really worked. If we had played, if we had chosen the music, I also know that some people would have hated the music. So we let you choose music that you liked. How about that? And um, we just went with it. Now, later, somebody said, you know, I, I suspect they weren't really dancing to music. They were just moving around because they didn't want to look stupid like that. OK, so they were dancing with us anyway. I'm not I, I'm not sure why that matters. And I'm not sure that's true. But the reason to mention that is somebody pointed, took a picture before and after. Before that, everyone was kind of like, oh, what's going on? After that, everybody was smiling and ready for the next strange thing to happen. So that felt like an important, I think, if you don't draw the message, the, the, the learning from that, I will, is that people are craving community experiences online. And there are a lot of ways to create community experiences that are shared that don't have to be very facilitated, just some weak suggestions, like put on some music and dance in front of the camera. I mean, how? Now, I hesitate. I didn't want to share that because I think people will hear it and go do it. And now the next time I try to do that, Everyone's like, oh, we've done that five times in the last week. We don't want to do it anymore. So I gave you that instead of holding that for myself. But Brilliant. So your other question was the, the space we built, right? Let me share my screen when I remember how. So when I'm designing facilitation, I, I try to design facilitation that doesn't involve screen sharing, at least on Zoom. Because when, as we've experienced, when you share the screen, Zoom is really in, intrusive and disruptive, I find, with the screen sharing. It changes your viewports. So if you, I've got everything set up the way I want it to be. If you share your screen, everything changes. I'm lost. I'm having a hard time interacting with your shared screen. I'm wondering why I can't move my mouse because I've forgotten your you're sharing that screen. I'm like, well, I'm clicking and nothing's happening. All these, I'm sure everybody's experienced that. So I try to design facilitation that doesn't involve sharing the screen, which might mean just creating the facilitation so there's no reason to share the screen. Might mean sending a Google document out in advance and just letting people know where you are on the Google document, letting everybody share along. And I do think that another way to avoid sharing the screen is to use Kiko Chat. Those are my those are my top three to avoid sharing the screen. But I think at this time, it's really useful to share the screen so we can do a quick demo. But and that means I have to remember how to share my screen. I actually know, but it always takes me a moment. Uh, here we go. Yes. So here we are. Uh, this was the space that we designed. I'll step back one. I'll, I'll even step back to the beginning when I get um, in Kiko chat. The, the landing page before the RSVP, we wanted, we had the advantage of working with the Agile Alliance graphic designer on the main graphic, which is very helpful. The, the visuals from a professional graphic designer are, whether I want to admit it or not, just so much better than anything I mock up. Having that one visual there, which was professionally designed, was such a help. We wanted to describe what was happening when you were having trouble. And we wanted to set a little bit of the stage about our invitation. We toyed around. One of the principles I like to follow online is put up as few barriers to entry as possible. So we looked at ways to make entering into Kiko Chat through the RSV page even easier than it is now. And we had some ideas, weren't sure any of those were easier and decided to investigate that our, the next time we do something. Uh, participating, 
This is our space. We organize it into parades. Uh, at the beginning, we had our neutral ground where it starts. We had a technical help lounge and I invited Francois to hold the technical technology space, which, and he did, he agreed. And that was a gift to us really. Uh, and then we had the names changed here. Um, I must have updated that in my sleep. Uh, oh, there it is. The Agile, the Agile Alliance Lounge, because at all of the Agile Alliance conferences, there is an Agile Alliance Lounge where a representative of the Agile Alliance is sitting there to hang out with you for any reason, should you need to talk about an issue or should you just want to hang out in a lounge. So we just put that into our Mardi Gras space as well. And the managing director, Ellen, from the Manage the Agile Alliance, stayed in that lounge and had some really good conversations with people there, I've heard from the, not from Ellen, but from the people who told me I spent a little good, I had a good time talking with Ellen in the lounge. Um, and then finally, we had parades around the world. So we announced, we let people know in the gathering to find the place where you would like to go to a parade. You might just lean into, I've always wanted to visit Trinidad and Tobago, so I'll go to one of those parades. Or you might look through and see what the purpose is in the various parades and choose that way. So we had people then under their own mobility, distributing themselves uh, and choosing, choosing where to watch a parade. We renamed breakout rooms to breakaway areas because we wanted to have an outdoor feel. I'm not sure if that was helpful or confusing, but I enjoyed it. And um, within each space, I'll just look at Trinidad and Tobago here. Depending on where, where we were in our process of building the event, uh, we had a picture that came from our postcard of the location uh, in the first tab. Uh, then we had created some questions in the second tab that talked to the theme. This particular Trinidad and Tobago theme was opening the jam and it was on music and purpose. It's also play on the words because when we do at the Agile Alliance, when we do an event that's like open space, but not quite open space, we want to we want to be upfront about the fact that it's like open space, but it's not open space that we call it open jam. So, okay, there was a little play on words there, opening the jam. And then we have a series, we, we had a, a question about the music and purpose in Trin Trinidad and Tobago that came from our postcards that we sent out ahead of time. And then we asked people to process those questions in the way they choose, really self-organize themselves. We offered people a whiteboard uh, and eventually as the event progressed, we used the, uh, the chat, uh, this chat window in a global way. So, no matter which space you're in, you saw what was going into this chat. So you could start pollinating ideas outside of breakaway areas to other areas. Super. I love it, Steve, love the colors. And working with you on this, you were asking me questions about how do you customize this and that. It was very thoughtful. You even, right around the time of this event, another facilitator asked for something called dark mode, which is just how do I make the screen darker if my eyes are sensitive? And I, you were the, I would never imagine someone would go to the lengths to even accommodate for how do we make dark mode look better on my event, but you went for it. And I, I just think that was such a kind gesture of you to spend your time to, to make dark mode work for your participants even better than the default. And that is what we should all strive for is to, to make it not just the feeling of inclusivity, but the tech has to support that too. And that's also an area where we have to improve in Kiko Chat to make it easier to have captions and transcriptions and, and everything else related to that. Um, but I just wanted to say, it's a, it's, it looks beautiful and it, it, it did a gorgeous job. Um, Thank you. And one something happened behind the scenes there you don't know about with the with the dark mode, 
Um, we we did invite people who were had with facilitation skills to use their own mobility to move around parade areas. And if they felt that their facilitation skills could add something, they could facilitate a little bit. I spent some time talking to them about the mindset of open space and letting people find their own facilitation. But one of our volunteer people with facilitation skills saw this and uh, for her, the colors and the mix of colors was just too jarring. It was too much cognitive load. And she started, and I love this, she started to complain about it. And then I don't even know how she did it. And then Francois added in, but I remember she came up with it first. She said, there's a dark mode. And that was the first time I knew there was a dark mode because you had just added it. Except the dark mode just didn't, just interfere too much with my colors. So then we worked together and we got it to work with our colors. That was fantastic. Yep, that was a suggestion you made to make it possible to even customize the dark mode, which we're gonna be making better defaults so that the person who's not familiar with how to customize colors doesn't have to worry about it, but you did a fantastic job. Is there any anything else from the participant experience that you wanna share? So participants can move around. You've got pre-designed activities for them. They're joining Zoom in these different parade rooms. And then what did you find that they were talking about? Well, I stayed, um... I stayed in, in the main spaces and, and worked on things in the background. So I don't know what they talked about. I really don't. And I, ha I, I, I haven't gone to look yet even because all of the artifacts that they've left, whatever they've left are there, um, which I think they can come back to the space and find their own artifacts at any time. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked, but I, I keep getting messages from people that say, we didn't know what to expect, but but we didn't know we were going to love it and we did or we just didn't know how fun it could be and they said we got in there and we thought how are we going to organize ourselves around these questions and then we just did so that's my feedback from participants is that i received anyway was it worked for us um i did hear from a participant who said it was really lovely. Now, what we did in our in our facilitation, we invited people first to go to, uh, to different parades and have the first discussion. And then we brought them back to the neutral ground for a moment, the main area. And then we asked some people to choose a different parade and other people to stay in the parade and just go back and see how those conversations cross-pollinated. And one of, one of the participants feedback to us was, The second group I was in, that conversation just wasn't very interesting, and I wanted to be in the other conversation, which I find so interesting because there's nothing in the platform that prevented her from moving to another conversation. It's just our expectations, which we were trying to, we want to create a platform to allow people to find a way to move around and actually see where they're moving, which Kiko Chet does. Um, we had a we had some negative experiences, and I learned a lot from the negative experiences. We had some unexpected technical challenges. They'll happen. I think in my career doing online, I've prepared for every possible technical challenge, and then there will be a new one that I've not prepared for. And we had a few technical challenges. And What I've also, what I feel I've noticed going to several Kiko Chat events is that when the space is well designed, or when you're going with your basic layout in both, because that's well well designed, um, there's about I, this is just an estimation, no scientific study. About two percent of the participants aren't able to figure it out. But and ninety eight percent of the participants are, and this is just my estimate that those that's the percentage. So the vast majority figure it out. What I've also observed is in most cases, the the two percent of the people that aren't figuring it out for whatever for a multitude of reasons, they get helped by the other ninety eight percent, and very soon everybody's playing along. 
occasionally the person with the loud microphone interjects that they can't figure it out and this is hard to figure out. And it's very interesting because at that moment, 98% of, of the people forget it, can't figure it out anymore. Um, and so we had some aspects of that. We were really trying to work with that. If you're in a position that's inter, uh, identified as a leader here in the space or a volunteer, just step back and let people figure out the space because as soon as somebody identified as a leader jumps in either to voice confusion or to help, they draw everybody running to solve the problems, which I found on Kiko Chat, often people are just able to organize themselves on this platform, unless we're having this condition where a loud voice is telling people that they can't organize themselves. Okay. Um, What we've seen in several open space events and what I've been toying with, um, and I'm thinking out loud here, we talk in open space about the space invader who through the best, often in the writing, through the best of intentions and with it, with great passion, attempts to hold on to the space be for the best to, to help the space. And I'm thinking we have technical space invaders who are the ones who need to monopolize the space, either helping other people move around or trying to figure out how to move around themselves. And this can be really, I find, it can take away the space that you've given to a lot of people. So this idea of inviting somebody like Francois to hold that technology space, and a person who comes in with an open space facilitator's mindset that can pull that person who needs that extra technical help aside to a lounge, or to a breakout room and work with them to understand how they can organize in the space and then with their mobility proceed to re-enter the space. I I'm also feeling uncomfortable about saying we bring people into breakout room because that seems like restricting mobility, but that's why I feel the technical whiz that is an open space facilitator has some experience being able to do that in a way that that maintains mobility. Steve, that's that's excellent. Um, there were a few questions here. Romy had asked about what tech problems that someone might encounter. And I think that Romy, the, the most common one that I've seen is that someone doesn't know how to get to a breakout room at the point that it's time to move to breakout rooms. And I usually recommend that you tell people how to do that only then when it's time to move because if you tell them at the beginning when you gather you're taking the, the your eyes off the purpose of, of being there i think it's always good to just get right into the program as quickly as possible and then when and steve's mentioning it's someone kind of throws off the process as you're instructing people how to how they can move around and someone says something like wait this is i don't get it or i don't see this button and i i will kindly but and firmly say, thank you, mention their name. We're gonna get you exactly where you need to go. Uh, just one moment, most of the people are already on their way out. We're on, and then I just, I don't pause there to give them a moment to speak. I just repeat the instructions one or two times. I find three times is fantastic. 75% of the people will be out of the room into the breakouts already in 30, 45 seconds. And then you have 25% of the people who maybe want to hear the question, but then it's a lot less stressful because now you've reduced the group to a smaller number, people feel calmer, and then we're all more productive in answering those questions. Romy had another question, Steve, if you'd like to answer also, and, and also talk about any other tech challenges. Uh, she had asked, was there a gathering at the end, a kind of a closing circle? And I'll also add, was there a gathering at the beginning, an opening circle? There was, it wasn't an opening circle. We had the gathering at the beginning where we welcomed people. We did a, we knew people would be arriving as is traditional these days when an event's in the middle of the day, people be arriving uh, not exactly on time. And so we planned to have people arriving over a few minutes and just having some informal type conversations. Then we did the welcome. 
uh, we explained what was going on. It was not an opening circle, but we were also mindful of how an opening circle with open space would work. So we told what was, we explained what was going to happen. We we explained what was going to happen. And in this case, since we weren't collecting any type of marketplace, uh, we then let people go to the space as you, pe uh, people started moving, as you said, and then for the people that were hanging back and having trouble, we started to repeat the technical explanation. That's what we did at the beginning. Uh, but yes, at the very beginning, we did set up the invitation, the reason for joining and things like that. Um, we had a welcome from the sponsor, which was very important as she talked about the whole purpose of us gathering this way in the first place. And we did gather for the closing. And the closing was, because of our time frame, was pretty short. It was a celebration. We made a little bit of noise. And we, because of the timing and because of the event, we didn't feel like share, share outs or what, what would add value into that space? But and we asked, um, and we asked people where they where they were now and what their intention was when we celebrate one year from now. What do they intend to celebrate one year from now? And so we had some answers. People put those in chat. We had a nice goodbye. We hung out a little bit, danced a bit, and that was the end. We did definitely want to bring people together into closing circle space. And we I reminded them every time everybody came together, because we brought people back together uh, in the middle for a few minutes, um, that there would be a closing because there's always this unfortunate feeling when somebody has missed the fact that there is a closing circle and thinks that it's just over and goes home and just missed this, the rest of us gathered in the circle. So we tried to repeat that as, in as many ways as possible. There will be a closing. We will join back together as one. <laughs> Super. Well, I'll stop the screen sharing here and oh, see yes. if we have any additional questions from the group. Steve, this was fantastic and uh, inspiring. Uh, just and hear the backstory because I only saw you know our technical interactions with how do I do this and this and this, but to hear how you approached the, the intention of the event and how you made it come to life. Let's see. We'll pause. To see if there's any additional questions. Steve, I've just loved. Um, it's not really a question, but I've just loved the tone in which. And I'm not surprised having sort of met you very briefly before <laughs> the tone with which you've held the whole process right from conceiving it to bringing everybody in from around the world to making it engaging and possible to participate. I didn't know anything about the dark, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> Brand new. It's awesome. <laughs> um, so I just really honor the how you've held that space you've obviously done it a million times before but um yeah um it's a fantastic example for me seeing how you did that thank you so much oh, thanks Romy. i appreciate that because um uh, well some of the, some of the inspiration came from that event that you held where you just said how do we how do we do this and i i was listening i'm like well if there's i mean I felt like I kind of knew what we were, well, we were already well on our way to building this, but I was, oh, that would be a little way, but that's something we could do. So we, yeah, that, that was, I remember that. It's a team effort. Well, Eric has a question. We'll give Steve the final word and then conclude. Okay. Um, just in terms of actually going into a breakout, one of your breakout rooms for a parade, is there actually a parade running on a shared screen video and then everybody can sort of comment about it as, a, as if you're standing on the curb, having a kind of a conversation with someone who's sharing a space. And um, so I guess that's, is that the experience that people were having? It was not, it wasn't the experience we designed. Um, Francois had a video of the Basler Fasnacht uh, from Basel, Switzerland running as his his background. So there was a parade if you were talking to Francois, which was awesome. Um, what we 
what we were building was just a still picture when people entered a parade site. And it, I really love that question, was there a parade that people could watch and comment on? Because after this experience, I started talking about other things that need to happen, or that I would well, need to happen, let's say other things that I'd really like to see happen as people come to virtual conferences to have the hallway that's like a real hallway where all kinds of chaotic generative conversations from silly to, to very profound are happening. You know, we talk about open space being a way to have those hallway conversations for the whole conference, but now things have changed. We're having online open spaces and now we just need the hallway. We're gonna have to build the hallway. So we start, I started from here looking, okay, we can build a prey. How are we gonna build that hallway? And one of the thoughts that that were that are coming up from this experience is provide something like watching a parade that people can do together and comment on. So yeah, I, next time I'm going to say that I got the idea from Eric and we're going to do that. We're going to have the parade at the next Mardi Gras. I have I have one quick question. Could you see doing all of this in spatial chat? Me personally, no. Um, I mean, I think it's possible. I wouldn't want to design that. Um, I think so. So, Lucas, I didn't answer your earlier question. I forgot. Uh, we didn't know how many people we had. We had an amazing number of registrations for just thinking how events run. And we were we didn't know we might have 50 or 500. We had three around 300 res registrations. I don't have the exact number. And a good portion of them showed up, 280 or so. Some people decided this is not for them, and they had they used their mobility to to find something else. And the people who stayed, this is exactly what they needed. But I think with 300 people in this space, I'm wondering how how spatial chat seems difficult to manage. I wonder, I wonder, I mean, I think there are lots of great reasons for spatial chat, but I always ask when moving online, I, I, tr I don't try to repeat the experience of being in the room. I ask, I try to find out I, how can we build the outcome? And so I think with spatial chat, which has its uses, uh, what, you're, what you're duplicating is the idea of moving close to each other and finding yourself in conversation. So what I was hoping to design was ways for people to move about in this more virtual breakout room sort of way to have that similar experience and imagine themselves doing what's happening in spatial chat in this other way. I, does that, I hope that approaches an answer to your question. Follow up question. There was a follow-up question in the chat about what is spatial chat and there's a class of tools that are pretty neat, especially for open space facilitators where you can move yourself on the screen. I can drag myself near Francois and he and I, and anyone that's close will be on audio and video together. And then I can just drag myself over to another corner and I'll, I'll hear and see the people there. And I'll drop some links in the chat where you can test those tools out. We, we were very interested in using spatial chat as in another parade, in like a single parade space that that parade was gonna be a spatial chat space for people who really would enjoy that experience. And we felt with the limited amount of time and the number of people we were potentially expecting, we wanted to keep it a little bit simpler and just provide one metaphor for interaction rather than introduce another one. Had we, if, it was a, if it was a longer event, if it was a three-day event, I think we would have at least had at least one spatial chat parade. And in the short time, we didn't want to create additional ways to interact just to keep things a little bit simpler. Steve, thank you very much for this interview. We'll give it back to you for any final thoughts and then we'll see everyone when we see them online. Well, I have more final thoughts than we have time for. Um, I'm not sure that it's, it's, most people wouldn't um, talk about a failure mode in a final thought, but as I look honestly at this space, I noticed that one thing was happening. This is a beautiful space. I mean, it's beautiful for me because I laid it out mostly. Uh, 
And I noticed people were struggling to find the join video button a little more than I usually see people. And I think my guess is that the amount of information and just the everything visual on this page was distracting from the join button. So I think a learning here, I would keep this excitement and party parade feeling and reduce the cognitive load a little bit. That, that would be learning that I feel is important. We also had a lot of information in the top banner where we gave people lots of ways to connect if they're having problems. So we could, we had one of the event supporters from the Agile Alliance on an actual 1-800 number to take a phone call if you needed to get help that way. So that was, that was a way we provided some more help. Final thoughts. Um, well, it was a lot of fun. We learned a lot. Romy heard me say at another event that, you know, the challenging thing about doing this kind of thing online is that when we were all meeting in the same place, we were lucky enough to walk into a building where the walls are there. There is a room there and there are chairs somewhere that we can arrange in a circle. And those are important. And as we move into the virtual space, we just, we don't only have to build the room and the chairs, we got to build the whole damn conference center. And so I wouldn't reproduce an actual, personally, I don't find a lot of value in reproducing an actual conference center. I know some tools are doing that. I find a lot of value in thinking about how you can lay out a, a, a system using a framework. What I love about Kiko Chat is the framework if you want to get into the framework nature of it, kind of using a framework to build out a way to let people move around through the space you've created for them. I mean, it'd be so easy if we just had walls and some chairs to put in a circle. And you know, there's also, it's possible I've seen really good things happening with much less customization in the Kiko chat. So when you're, when you're starting there, you do kind of have your walls and your chairs. Thank you, Lucas. And my, my last thought is, as Agilists are, First tenet of the Agile Manifesto is we value individuals and interactions over process and tools. And the, my tenet to working online in this way is, or this is more my simple rule, um, it's individuals, then interactions, then processes, then tools in that order, meaning individuals first, if we're confused about that order. And I see, I see so many people start with the tool and end with the individual. And a lot of facilitation is designed by picking a tool and then doing what the tool allows. Um, I, wanna pay, I wanna have a tool that doesn't restrict my mobility or the participant's mobility that allows the choice, that allows the open space principles. And Kiko Chat is, one of those tools. So once you have the tool like Kiko Chat, then it's then you're focusing first on the individuals, then the interactions, and then the processes. So I want to I want to keep working in that way and see where we we go next. Super, and that's also so helpful for me to hear as I as I work on it, incorporating that feedback. So we we keep that front and center. I'll stop the recording here and thank everyone for joining us. Uh, the room will stay open so you can continue the conversation if there's anything else. But thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, especially Steve and Francois for supporting Steve. Congratulations on a great event and thank you for sharing all these learnings. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much for the inspiration. It uh, helps me get even more excited about, ooh, what are all the possibilities of this? Thank yeah. you, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I I didn't I I didn't I didn't make any of the bullet points that I I would have loved that I that I intended to or thought about ahead of time. I didn't even really intend to. I just thought about some bullet points ahead of time. But I I will say another thing I noticed about online is I believe I feel like people have a tendency to look for ways to to just structure everything because the idea is a webinar is structured. You get online, add more structure, add more control, which is fine when that's what you're facilitating. Uh, 
is not what I'm facilitating. It's not what an open space facilitator like you is facilitating. So anything that in, that leads you to thinking I need more control might be the wrong direction. And it, so I'm asking myself, okay, how do we embrace the complexity and the chaos and just provide and provide the simple rules that we need to have? As Harrison says, one more, no, hang on, one less thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 